Good evening. Thank you for joining us. My name is Charmaine Ludlow, and on behalf of Dean Valdez and the entire Macaulay community, I would like to welcome you to our first Macaulay Entrepreneur Series, spotlighting Ethan Frisch, Macaulay Class of 2008. And moderating tonight, the conversation will be Jane Chen, Macaulay Class of 2021. We created this series to spotlight our alumni who are going after the American dream and becoming entrepreneurs. Small businesses make up about 98% of New York State businesses and some of the best employment opportunities can be found within entrepreneurial ventures. So I would like to introduce our speakers. Um, Ethan Frisch is the co-founder of Burlap and Barrel, single origin spice company and social enterprise working with smallholder spice farmers around the world to build new markets for heritage ingredients. He is a native New Yorker, entrepreneur, and advocate, and advocate, I'm sorry, activist around food systems and social justice. Ethan has worked in kitchens as a line cook, as a pastry chef in New York and London, and as the chef behind Gorilla Ice Cream. He left kitchens to become a humanitarian aid worker and worked with NGOs, including the Aga Khan Foundation in Afghanistan, the Marie Stoops in Sierra Leone, and Doctors Without Borders on the Syrian-Jordanian border. He serves on, social, on several boards, including the boards of directors of the Bond Street Theater, which uses theater to teach conflict resolution and resilience in areas of instability around the world. Restaurant After Hours, addressing the mental health crisis in the restaurant industry, and the student-led racial literacy and justice organization Choose as well as the advisory board of Fragments Theater, a youth theater company in Palestine. He is also on the or, or organizing committee of Queens International Night Market and has been an adjunct lecturer at the City College of New York and an instructor with the Experiment in International Living's Leadership Institute. He holds a bachelor's degree in conflict studies and education and social, and social change from Macaulay Honors College at the City University of New York and a master's degree in violence, conflict and development from the University of London School of Oriental and African Studies. So I'd like to thank Ethan for being here tonight. Moderating tonight's event is Jane Chen. Jane was born and raised in Queens, New York. She started her career in equity and community engagement when she joined Lyft Corporate at 19 years old. Currently still at Lyft as a program manager, she's focusing on bringing equitable access to transportation for low-income populations and communities of color. In her role, she runs an annual community, community grants program, which supports NGOs and community organizations across New York City. She also consults on community and equity strategy across various corporations. Prior to her career at Lyft, she worked as a freelancer photographer, specializing in portraiture and, and events, which sparked her interest in finding the intersection between social impact, creativity, and solution-oriented entre entrepreneurship. Her clients range from artists such as Gunna and Tiana Taylor to small women-owned businesses like Happy Fish Fashion. As a freshman in college, she worked at a media company producing events for Columbia Records and the Butler Group. She is currently finishing her last year of studying entrepreneurship management at Baruch College, where she is a proud Macaulay student. So thank you both for being here with us tonight. And right now, I'll go ahead and pass it over to you, Jane. Thanks, Jermaine, for that great introduction. Um, and thank you, everyone, for being here today. Ethan and I are super excited uh, to just have a unstructured chat with everyone. Um, I had the opportunity to chat with Ethan and learn a little bit more on Friday and I can assure everyone he's got some great advice. Um, so just before we dive into our journey, I see that we've already got a Q&A question. Thanks, thanks, Stacey. And I really encourage everyone just to send your Q&A questions in the chat as we talk. Um, we won't, you know, you don't need to wait until the end, end of our conversation. You know, if something comes up, feel free to put it in the chat and we'll address it. We also have some pre-registration questions that I'll get to as well, um, but really hope that we can uh, learn a lot, which I, I think we actually will. <laughs> uh, so Ethan, I'd love to just pass it over to you and uh, let you introduce yourself and Burlap and Barrel. Sure. Sure. Well, uh, good to talk to you all tonight. Thanks, uh, Jane and Charmaine, for setting it up and, and inviting me to talk to you. Um, as uh, Charmaine mentioned, I'm the co-founder of a company called Burlap and Barrel. We are a single origin spice company, a public benefit corporation. We've been in business five years. Um, I uh, started the business after a long string of other jobs that I did for short periods of time. 
uh, but learned a lot at each one of them. And, and they all kind of came together into this business, which before starting it, I had no idea I could like could even exist, let alone uh, something that I could do. It wasn't like a, a always a career aspiration to own a spice company. Uh, it really came out of all the other experiences I had had leading up to it. Um, and uh, now I get to work with small farms, with farmers all over the world, mostly people who have never exported before. So we help farmers set themselves up to export for the first time. And then we buy their spices, we import them, and we sell them to anybody we can convince to buy them. Sometimes it's restaurants, chefs and restaurants. Sometimes it's home cooks. Sometimes it's um, uh, manufacturers of all kinds of things. You know, we supply breweries and bakeries and ice cream companies and all kinds of other uh, manufacturers. But uh, the, the focus of our business, the bulk of our business is direct to consumer. So um, if, if people have questions about running an e-commerce business or a D2C business, that's what we do most of the time. Um, and so we can get into some of those details uh, later on. Yeah, awesome. Um, Ethan, before we kind of jump into how you started your business and really like the ins and outs of, of starting a small business, I'd love to hear from you just a little bit about like your venture prior to Burlap and Barrel um, and kind of your journey from college and graduating and then kind of what led you, led you to Burlap and Barrel first. Sure. Yeah. So I, I graduated in 2008. We were just talking before the session. I was the fourth uh, or maybe fifth graduating class of, of Macaulay students ever. Um, so it was a brand new program. Uh, and I graduated in, into uh, the financial crisis or really just before the financial crisis. Um, so I had a, a job right out of college that I'd gotten through an internship through City College at a political foundation, uh, but I got laid off uh, about nine months later, uh, no, a little over a year later, because um, they lost their endowment, and I wound up working in restaurant kitchens, because I had just always loved to cook, and I needed a job, and it seemed like an interesting thing to do, so I, I kind of luckily stumbled into an interview at a restaurant that really needed somebody right away. They didn't care that I didn't have any experience at all. They were, you know, can you start right now? You're hired. Um, and so I did that for a while. I worked at that restaurant. I worked at a couple of others, um, but was always interested in coming back to international relations and, and conflict studies. That's, I had done a design your own major through the CUNY BA program um, in conflict studies I, too, actually in education and social change as well. Um, and so I wound up going, going to graduate school, getting a master's in international development with a focus on conflict, and then moving to Afghanistan. Uh, and I worked for a big NGO there. I had a, just an incredible experience. And that was really where the very beginning of Burlap and Barrel started, or I should say it started when I was working in restaurants before that. But when I went to Afghanistan, I tasted this variety of wild cumin that grows in the mountains in the Northeast. I had worked at a pretty high-end Indian restaurant here in New York, a place called Tabla that you may or may not remember. It's been closed for a long time, but uh, it was a groundbreaking restaurant, um, kind of the first fine dining Indian restaurant in America, if not uh, maybe the world outside of India. Um, so uh, I knew a lot about spices. I knew a lot about cooking with spices. I had learned under a really amazing chef. And then I tasted this cumin in Afghanistan and started to bring it home. I, I, you know, it wasn't a business. I was just bringing home suitcases full of spices and dried fruit and nuts and honey and all kinds of delicious things while I was working there. I was working on a big infrastructure uh, construction project through the NGO uh, that I worked for. Um, and over the course of several years, uh, started to think about what it would what it would be like to turn that idea of bringing spices home into a business. I had, I had shared them with friends in the restaurant industry, chefs who were really excited to taste them um, and who couldn't get anything else like it. Uh, and then I'd had conversations initially with producers, growers in Afghanistan, farmers or foragers in the case of Afghanistan, but, um, and then uh, with producers in other countries as well, who almost always knew that there was a higher value market out there. They knew they could be making more money um, especially if they were growing something special, which the people we work with are always. Um, so uh, we, you know, I, I was having these two, and what they were missing really was the, the supply chain, was the process to bring their product to the market that would pay that top dollar for it. Um, and so I was, I realized I was having kind of the same conversation on both ends, chefs who were excited to cook with ingredients they'd never been able to get access to before, and farmers who were excited to get access to those chefs. 
Um, and that because I have worked in both of those contexts, because I'm, I'm a, a chef myself, I, I can make decisions about what chefs might like and, and talk to uh, growers, farmers in, in rural areas, like, a, like an aid worker, for better or for worse. Um, and uh, that was really the, the very beginning of the business. Yeah, it sounds like you tapped into this this value proposition, this market where you were fulfilling a lot of your passions, but also finding this missing connection between two really important parties in what's in what's running your business now. And I, I know we have a lot of questions, uh, both from registration and from Stacy. So I guess we'll just jump right in. Um, you know, when you were when you were founding uh, Burlap and Barrel. Um, and specifically through the funding stages, can you talk a little bit more about how you initially funded it, um, you know, how you raised the capital and maybe some of the pain points that you were met with there? Uh, it's a huge question, a super important question. Um, Stacy, thank you for asking and good for you for thinking about that right out of the gate. I mean, it's um, the short answer is we, we didn't fundraise. Uh, we... Um, we started with a little bit of our own money. I'd been working at that point for almost 10 years. Uh, I was 30, maybe just, just I just not quite 30 when I started Burlap and Barrel. So I have a little bit of savings um, and I, I put that money into starting the business. Um, I ran the business out of my apartment for the first year at least. I mean, I still work from home, but uh, we had a, literally one ton, more than one ton of spices in my one, one bedroom apartment in Queens. I had registered <laughs> the apartment with the FDA and the New York State uh, Department of Agriculture to be able to do that. It was mostly legal, not 100%, uh, but enough legal enough to, to get the business off the ground because I didn't have any real money um, and I didn't know how to go out and fundraise. I still, I mean, I, now I have a better idea about how that would work, but I still don't really know how to do that. And, and I just wanted to see if I could get this idea off the ground myself. Um, and so I put a little bit of my own money into it. I ran it out of my apartment as cheaply as I could. We didn't hire anybody. We didn't spend any money. We didn't, we, we didn't absolutely have to spend. Um, and I, we didn't pay ourselves, my co-founder or I, uh, we didn't pay ourselves for the first two years. Um, I was on unemployment for a little while of that. There, you know, there were ways that I got by, but but it was not easy. And that was a, a challenging decision. And honestly, a decision we still question. We, we are still a bootstrap business. We have not taken outside investment. We've taken out loans, which has worked kind of differently. Um, but, um, but it has uh, made our growth more difficult um, in ways that, uh, you, you know, a, a venture-backed or an investor-backed company will have a lot more money to grow and grow more quickly and take bigger risks. And for us, because we haven't had that kind of money, uh, we've had to be really, really careful in how we spend it, really, really careful in the risks that the business takes on. Um, and just, you know, over and over again, question every dollar that we spend, is this really the best way that, there, you know, because there are a hundred ways we could spend that dollar. Uh, but what's the best way? What's the way that's going to have the, the most impact on growing our business? It's hard, uh, but, but I'll just say one more thing about that. As a social enterprise, um, it's really... It, it adds a level of complexity to funding a business uh, because a there's an assumption this is crazy but there's an assumption that as a social enterprise you're gonna you're gonna do worse so loans for social enterprises tend to charge higher interest rates because they assume that you're you're not gonna you're not gonna make it as a business so that makes it harder but then also as a social enterprise if you do go out to find investors um, it it will change the way that your that an investor looks at your business because they're gonna there's a there's a you know a profit motive and there's a values motive, um, and uh, investors are, are are going to be a little more hesitant to invest in a business that doesn't put profits absolutely first with, without values. So, um, yeah. Yeah, um, you know one of the key themes I think that comes out of like this conversation is this this want and this push to do socially good with whatever venture you're pursuing. Um, and it sounds like, you know, you've, you've talked about a little bit about just the funding challenges, but have you seen this challenge to continue to put, you know, the social impact first um, over profit in other, in other ways, whether it's like marketing or whether you're running sales. I think Stacy also had a question uh, about sales too. So I would love to hear about that. Yeah. Um... It, there are pros and cons for sure. Um, uh, for me, it was really important, not just because of my kind of values or, or my work experience, but also because um, I wanted to establish long-term relationships with the farmers that we source from. 
Um, and that means paying them more and, and building a real, uh, a real relationship. Um, and so that to me is, is kind of at the heart of our business, the relationships that we have with our partner farmers. Um, and the fact that that made the business a social enterprise was kind of an afterthought. The point was to build a business that, that valued those relationships, that incentivized people to grow higher quality ingredients, to do it organically or regeneratively, um, and, and to try to sell those ingredients you know, as they are, not, not routed through a crazy commodity supply chain that, uh, that sort of loses that quality. Um, so, so having it be a social enterprise has been really important, but it has also come with challenges. Um, the, the fundraising challenges I mentioned earlier, and, uh, I guess, um, the, on a, from a marketing and, and sales perspective, um, a social enterprise carries a lot of marketing weight with it. So customers really want to know where their food is coming from, where their ingredients are coming from, that the business that they're paying money to, that they're buying from, is putting that money to good use. And so that's been really helpful uh, in terms of marketing. And to Stacey's question about sales channels, actually, you know, our, our biggest sales channel today is direct to consumer, is, is e-commerce through our website. Um, and part of the reason for that is because we have been really lucky with uh, press coverage because journalists really like to write about social enterprises, really like to write about the, the mission as well as the business. And so we've gotten quite a bit of press and that press has driven e-commerce sales because people read an article, they come to our website, they buy the cinnamon or the turmeric or whatever it was that was written about in that article. And then they come back and buy more things over time. So um, overall, I mean, I, for me, it wasn't, it wasn't necessarily a decision exactly. It was always going to be a social enterprise. That's, that was the only kind of business I was interested in, in doing or even being involved in. Um, but, uh, but for other people, I think there's, if, if you're coming into it and looking for the advantages of a social enterprise, I think there are a lot of upsides, um, especially from that marketing and, and, uh, and sales perspective. Yeah, even I think you bring up a great point and just like as a equity and community engagement professional, like I'm seeing the importance of a brand being more than just the products and services and being more about the, the North Star mission and the social impact values that they're bringing to the table. So I think, you know, when you're building a community on your products and services, and we'll dive a little bit more into that because you had some really great stories to share around building a community. Um, you know, we'll dive a little bit more into that, but um, I, I also really agree with Stacey, really highly admirable to just bootstrap all the way. Um, and you should have a question about navigating the import and export red tape to bring those tons of products in. So if you want to answer that one, yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, you know, importing spices is fairly easy. I, I don't know if you have uh, experience importing anything else or you, you've talked to other companies that have done that, but um, the US is pretty easy going about importing spices because we're not competing with any domestic producers. Although we've started to get some domestically grown spices, that's kind of a different story. But you know, there's no cinnamon grown in the US, so there are no tariffs uh, to import cinnamon from Vietnam and Zanzibar, which is where we get ours from. Um, you know, it's a process like any other government process. It's like getting a driver's license or renewing your passport or mailing a letter at the post office. Like it's a process. It's not always the easiest uh, or clearest one, but it works if you if you understand kind of how to approach it. And so I, I did a lot of that myself, my, my all the paperwork and driving out to the airport at three in the morning the first year to pick up a shipment that had come in from somewhere and they were gonna start charging me storage fees. I didn't want to do it. so. Um, but now uh, we're finally at a size where we have a freight forwarder, a, a shipping company that we work with quite a bit, a customs broker um, who handles all of the paperwork for us. And that's really her area of expertise. And she does it way better than I could. And I think that's also kind of a, a thread that runs throughout entrepreneurship is, is you do the job until you can afford to hire somebody better to do that same job. I always, you know, I came into this without knowing anything about international shipping. I didn't know anything about logistics. I didn't know anything about food safety. I didn't know anything about sales. I didn't know anything about all of the little pieces that today make up my day-to-day -day job. Um, and I had to learn all of that. And some of it, I was able to learn enough or learn fast enough uh, that I didn't need to, to outsource it, or I still haven't needed to outsource it. But a lot of it, um, you know, you, you hire a professional, you hire an expert as soon as you can, because uh, they'll, they'll make it worth your while. They'll, they'll do work better. That's, that's worth that money. Yeah, small but mighty team. I think uh, that's that's a good way to put it. Uh, 
And just digging a little bit more into, you know, you talked about wearing lots of hats before you expand your team. We have a question from Shamika that was from pre-registration. It was about balancing and organizing your time. You know, when you're wearing all these hats, um, are you using any specific tools or apps that you're relying on to really get that work done? Uh, there's no, I mean, at least for me, there was no organizing my time. It's a train wreck all the time. <laughs> You know, it's, there are there are other ways to start a business, but the way that I started this business was just by working 20 hours a day as much as I could to try to get as much of the work done as possible. And uh, the, the quality of the work may not have been the best all the time, but, um, you know, I think one of the things that I've learned through doing this is that uh, you learn so much more after you start a process than while you're just thinking about starting it. Um, and so... I had kind of set this target for myself. I had a, another job over the summer that was going to go through September. This was the summer of 2016 as I was starting the company. So I had another job that summer that was going to be ending in September. And I said to myself, I'm going to give myself October to December. I'm just going to try this. Here's a three-month window. Here's whatever it was, $10,000 I was going to start with. Um, and let's see if I can make it work. Um, let's see if I can find some restaurants who are willing to buy the spices. Let's see if I can bring some shipments in. Uh, let's see if I can figure out packaging and a website and all of the other many hats that you have to wear to do it. And, and it did start to work. It was not by any means an immediate success and it really never has been, although COVID has had a, a strange impact on the business that we can talk about, but um, it, it was, it was, and still is in many ways, slow going. You make incremental progress on things. You feel like you're banging your head against the wall most of the time, not making any uh, measurable progress and then like something clicks into place or you, you have a something happens where you start to see some progress um but it's always a slow process and it it always is it's not a process of choosing what you are going to do it's a process of choosing what you're not going to do because uh you have to take some things off the table and then you try to do everything else yeah that's a that's a really interesting way to frame it right like instead of you know, what you are going to do what not to do um and stacy wants to just appreciate your time, which uh, definitely, definitely also appreciate that. Um, and I think uh, Stacy, Ethan will be able to share his contact information at the end. So if you're going to stick around, uh, you can connect with him uh, as well. And Jean, I love the farm to fork. <laughs> I really like that slogan. Um, Ethan, you know, we, we talked a little bit about this kind of idea of like diving right in, right? And I think a lot of young entrepreneurs or people who are looking to step into this space have this question of, um, you know, when do I quit my job? Or, you know, like, when do I know it's time to give 110%, um, you know, to this venture? At, at what stage should I be ready to do that? Um, you know, you talked a little bit about that, but just generally from your experience, what do you recommend to people? Yeah, I would recommend finding a way to experiment with entrepreneurship before you commit. Um, I had a summer, the summer of 2010, where the restaurant I'd been working at closed and I, I started making ice cream and, and uh, started an ice cream cart um, with my current business partner, my current co-founder as well, actually. Um, so we had a three month uh, experimental period where we got to try out this entrepreneurship thing and then we moved on in our lives. It, you know, you can't run an ice cream cart in New York City after September anyway, after August anyway. So uh, that was a really interesting um, experience for me. Um, and working in, in restaurants, which are small businesses and other jobs that I'd had gave me a lot of exposure. My mother also owned a small business my whole childhood. So I grew up in her, you know, in the store that she owned. Um, so I had, a, I had had a lot of exposure to entrepreneurship and small business. Uh, that's not necessarily the case for everybody. And so I always recommend finding a way to get some exposure, find a startup to do, a, you know, even a volunteer job with or um, try something really small, find the smallest version of your idea. If you're thinking about launching an e-commerce store, um, try an Etsy store with two products, one product, just, uh, just to sort of a test run to learn the ropes, understand some of the things that go into running your own business, how, how big of a, a bite it is. I think a lot of people don't realize, or maybe they, they do, but uh, once you're in it, you know, quitting a job is really hard for obvious, many obvious reasons, but um, I think a lot of people, one of the reasons that quitting it is so hard is because you don't understand the expanse that you're stepping into, right? There's, it's, it's very poorly defined. Um, and it really feels like that uh, for the first period, for the first six months, or you know, as long as it takes to kind of get your footing. Um, so finding ways to have that experience in, in like a protected setting, in an environment where you don't have any, you don't have too much of yourself or your own money on the line and can understand how a startup works. Um, I would highly recommend finding a way to do that. 
Um, or if you have an idea, just go for it and do it in a more limited way. Be a little careful in the beginning, uh, kind of test it out. Uh, there are lots of ways to do that, but um, but yeah, finding finding a way to to rehearse your idea under a uh, you know in in the protected <laughs> with, the, with the protection of of another context, whether it's a part time job and you're doing your your you're pursuing your idea you know, kind of on your own time in the evenings or on weekends uh, before you you take the full plunge. I love this idea of like a dress rehearsal for entrepreneurship. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, you said something really interesting to me on Friday. It was like. Uh, entrepreneurship is this additive experience, right? So like, even if you go for it and something doesn't work out, like you have all these learnings, right? And you've learned something, you've, you've grown, you've kind of saw, uh, you saw how that process works. So I think I really appreciated hearing that, like it was an additive process, uh, additive experience that, you know, you can back out of, you can come out of, uh, you know, you can take different directions. And, you know, this idea of like flexibility in entrepreneurship, you know, you talked about COVID and I, I'd love to jump into that. Um, but yeah, like tell the audience a little bit about COVID and the impact on your yeah. business. Well, that- I mean, just thank you for uh, reminding <laughs> me what I said the other day. Um, yeah. yeah, I mean, I, entrepreneurship or an entrepreneur, an entrepreneurial experience will be additive to your resume. So if you do decide to quit a job, go do something entrepreneurial for a year, a couple of years, and it doesn't work out for whatever reason, as many of them don't, um, when you go back to apply to other jobs, that entrepreneurial experience is going to look great to a, a potential employer. If somebody came to me applying for a job with us, and had pursued an entrepreneurial project, and then, uh, you know, it just didn't work. I would, I, I understand, like that. That means a lot on a resume. Um, and so, don't feel like you're taking away from your career, or your that uh, in, you know potential employers are gonna are gonna wonder how you spent that time. I think it it looks really good. Um, COVID, uh, COVID was a, a real roller coaster for us, as it was for m- most small businesses. I, I would say in the U.S. Um, Coming into March of 2020, we had a big restaurant supply business. That was half our business, which disappeared basically overnight because all the restaurants closed. Um, and we were really lucky uh, that Home Cooks came to the rescue. Uh, we had had a, a decent e-commerce business before that, decent direct-to-consumer, um, but uh, but it it really took off during COVID. And and our goal had always been to move the business towards a more e-commerce oriented structure, uh, do more direct to consumer sales. Um, but COVID accelerated that pretty significantly. And so now the business is about 85% direct to consumer, um, which is great, which is where we want it to be. And I can, we, I mean, I'll just run through some of the reasons why e-commerce is, is uh, better. It's more fun. Uh, you have more control. You can change things more easily. You can uh, change text on your website or think about how you're marketing something a little bit differently. Um, it's more profitable because you're selling directly to the end user instead of to a restaurant which is making a dish that they're selling or to a grocery store that still has to sell, you know, in our case, a jar of spices to a customer. Um, so it's more fun, it's more profitable, and you have a lot more control. Um, you you get to decide uh, what you're selling to your customers, and, and there's a lot of risk in that. You have to make sure you're, you're coming up with the right things that you know your customer base well, but if you get it right, there's a lot of potential. Uh, and you have a lot more control over how your business grows than you would if you were selling into a, a wholesale customer like a grocery store or, or a, you know, anybody else. Yeah, you talked a little bit about like reaching this like key market during COVID, right? And, and I would love if you could dig a little bit more into, you know, what does your target market look like? Did it always look like whatever your target market is right now? Um, sure. and, you know, is, yeah. is there a flexibility there? You know, um, and what are, your, what are your goals for the future target markets that you're hoping to reach? Yeah, we... You know, coming into um, coming into COVID, uh, our audience, our direct consumer audience, had been mostly older women outside of big cities. Um, there are people who are really good cooks, really love to cook, or often already buying specialty ingredients online. This was not an audience necessarily that we sat down and said, "This is who our business is gonna is gonna speak to." Uh, they they found us really, um, and I think a lot of people, uh, myself included make the sort of early misstep of thinking that you're selling to yourself, you're starting a business to sell to yourself. So for me, you know, I'm selling to a, a, you know, early guy in his early thirties who likes to cook and lives in New York city. And that seemed like a good market. Uh, But it turned out that was not really where our market was. It was, it was uh, with women, mostly over the age of 50 outside of big cities. We started to see a lot of orders from AOL email addresses. So, you you know, (laughs) Um, and then uh, through COVID, the demographic has changed. A lot more people were cooking at home. Uh, a lot more people were shopping online. 
um, for food at least. And, um, and we had an opportunity to sort of uh, show people the impact that really good spices can have on their cooking. And so we did a big press push. We've done a whole bunch of new launches, really doing a lot of work over the past year and a half to get people's attention while they're, while they're cooking and eating in this particular way that is not going to last forever. Um, and our challenge for next year, so that has worked. Uh, our, our base has grown a lot. Our business has grown a lot. We've, we're reaching a, a much wider demographic of cooks, but mostly pretty skilled home cooks. And so our challenge for next year, if anybody has any ideas, please tell me. Uh, our challenge for next year is to reach even a, a more beginner cook, somebody who's just learning to cook for the first time, somebody maybe who's living by themselves for the first time, or um, who is just kind of getting around to learning to cook or has found uh, cooking as a hobby. How do we help them cook better? How do we help them understand the value of higher quality ingredients and understand the value of sourcing across the board, not just with spices, but who are the people who produce those ingredients and why does that matter? Um, so that's, that's our demographic. Yeah. And if anyone has any ideas, feel free to pop that in the chat in the Q&A. Um, email me later. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, Ethan, I, you know, you talked a little bit about getting a new customer, right? And in this, like, this demographic that really just fits, um, you know, what your company is offering. Um, but can you talk a little bit more about once you've gotten that customer, how you keep them, right? How you retain them when, you know, you've got competition in the stratosphere to think about. Um, what are some of the strategies that you've been employing? Um, so uh, we have a very uh, proactive approach to customer service. Um, what we realized early on, and, and I think this is something a lot of startups miss, is uh, that we could just email our customers. Like we could just get in touch with people and get their thoughts on what they ordered and get their advice or their feedback or you know what was good about your order and what didn't work. Um, and we have maintained that kind of mentality through our growth, but turned it into a customer support, a customer service approach. So for the past like six, you know, the, the holidays are a big season for us. A lot of people buy spices for, you know, big meals that they're cooking at home or spices as gifts. There's, we do a lot of business over the holidays. So over the past six months, we've been basically a thank you note machine, like a thank you note factory. Uh, basically anybody who places a first order, anybody who places a gift order, anybody who places a big order, anybody who orders things that look funny for some reason, we just send out dozens of thank you notes a week. Um, proactive customer service, trying to retain the customers that we already have, but also give them something to talk about. You know, they're going to talk to their friend and say, this is weird. I placed an order with a spice company. And then they email me to say, thanks and give me a code. I don't know. It's um, trying to, trying to, to uh, bring our customers into a community, make it feel like a neighborhood business that just happens to be on the internet, but the kind of a business where you walk in and they recognize you and they, they, you know, they know a little bit about what you like. Um, we want our business to be an online version of that. And it's, it has, it has worked well. It's um, different from the way that a lot of e-commerce companies start or, or operate where e-commerce or where uh, customer service is, is really an afterthought. Um, but it's been uh, first, uh, you know, front and center of everything we do. Yeah, I, I love the cards. I can't remember the last time I got like a nice thank you card. So a <laughs> really nice touch there. Um, do you think that like social media has has also influenced, you know, your strategy of building community and, and retaining customers? Yeah, for sure. I mean, social media, um, uh, I, I did all of our social media for most for like the last four years. We just finally hired somebody to take it over uh, long, long overdue. I was very happy to hand it over to somebody who's better <laughs> at than I am and who likes doing it more than I do. Um, but, uh, yeah, I mean, social media is free advertising for a small business without much budget. Um, it's easy to connect with other like-minded people or organizations, and it's easy for people to find you, uh, easy for you to put content out into the world that you wouldn't really have a, a vehicle for otherwise. Um, and it gets a lot more complicated and a lot riskier, honestly, as you get bigger and you start looking at spending money on ads and, uh, thinking about customer acquisition on social media, but, um, for a small business, that's honestly, it could be the, the first or maybe the only place that you start is, uh, is on Instagram or on Facebook. Um, we, because of, you know, with our AOL uh, email address customers, uh, we found that Facebook is really where most of them are active. Um, and so we have a Facebook group, uh, about 6,000 people at this point who share recipe ideas or ask for advice, or I'm trying to pick between these two varieties of cinnamon, which one should I get? And, and uh, we've kind of accidentally wound up having our customers do a lot of the customer support work um, in the sense that they answer each other's questions, they help each other and they bring each other into a community. 
around the business, which is, which is really amazing. Yeah, I think that's really powerful. You know, like when we talk about community engagement, we have this framework where, you know, the lowest level of community engagement is where you inform people, you know, like people read, you know, a newsletter that you put out, but really ultimately the goal and the North Star vision is to get to where you empower people to talk about your brand and to interact and to uh, encourage others to do so. So it sounds like your AOL customers <laughs> have a great thing going on Facebook. Um, but yeah, I think that thanks for sharing a little bit more about like the role of social media that's been kind of like a hot topic conversation right over the past few years and the importance of business and social media. Um, you know, as we think about, I love to, you know, kind of go back to COVID and we think about a post pandemic world, you know, returning to a state of normal. Um, you know, you talked a little bit about the ex- expected challenges that you think you'll face, but are you, is there anything you're really excited about, um, you know, anything in the next few years that you're looking to expand on or grow? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, I'm really looking forward to uh, traveling again. Uh, I saw Charmaine had put a question in the chat about how we meet partner farmers, and there are lots of ways that we do that, but the ultimately a very important part of it is going to meet people in person, um, because we're starting what we hope will be a long-term business relationship. And I want to I want to know all about their farm and how they operate and what they care about and what they're optimizing for. And I want them to get to know me and understand a little more about our business. Uh, you know, we call them our partner farmers because it's really a partnership. Um, and so I'm looking forward to getting to do that again. Uh, we did. We just went to Hungary, my business partner and I, a few weeks ago to meet a paprika farmer. We have gotten to do some travel in the last few months, which is nice. Um, but big, big trips have been obviously off the table. Um, we are also kind of in, in a decision point about the business, about growth and, and larger goals. Uh, we've been growing very quickly. We've been growing pretty aggressively, which means a lot of work, a lot of time. I sit at this desk easily 14 hours a day, if not longer, um, because uh, what happened kind of in the middle of COVID, uh, the beginning of this year, beginning of 2021, we had seen a huge spike in orders last year, and um, just a crazy, bonkers, impossible to keep up holiday season. We sold out of pretty much everything, which was which was good. Um, and my co-founder and I had a conversation in January of 2021 to say, what what do we do? Right? Like, do we do we keep pushing? This has been an exhausting year, but there's an opportunity here. Do we keep pushing or do we step back and wait to see how the world changes and uh, and then respond? What we decided to do almost a year ago was to keep pushing, um, which has been, I I think the right decision, not an easy decision or an easy process, but but, uh, the right decision, not one that I regret at all. Um, And now the question is, uh, what do we do for 2022? the business is is big enough and stable enough that we can step out of the day-to-day, which is really important. We've hired an amazing group of people and we're hopefully gonna continue to hire some more um, to to manage a lot of the day-to-day stuff uh, and and let us as the co-founders, and I think, I mean, back to our larger conversation about entrepreneurialism and and, uh, advice, what are the things that, that only the co-founders of the business can do? And what are the things that you can hire other people to do? And there's no shame in that, right? Like you hire other people to do the things that they can do. And then you do the things that you can do. And that's, that's what delegation looks like as, as a co-founder. And so, um, or as a founder, so you, so that's what we need to do. Now we need to figure it out. I don't know what the answer is necessarily. We, uh, we need to sit down and spend some time thinking about what we want to do for next year, other than trying to reach more beginner home cooks and, and um, thinking about expanding the business into more retail, into more grocery stores and things like that, which we're starting to do. Like there are areas that are natural progressions, but there's also this, uh, I don't know, the, the, the creative vision of running a business to say, here's where I think the business should go, or here's where I want the business to go. And what do, I, what do we need to do as a team to, to make that happen? Yeah, I think a lot of, you know, 2022 is TBD and what a post-pandemic world looks like. <laughs> um, yeah, but, you know, you touched on something uh, you know, that's really important is this aspect of travel and seeing other cultures, you know, outside the one we've always seen um, and the importance of have, having had those experiences. So I'd love to know if, you know, Macaulay gave you the opportunity to travel um, and, you know, throughout your, your educational journey, you know, if you applied any of the skills, like I know that I'm taking entrepreneurship classes and I think it's so valuable um, and I'm really excited to apply those towards, you know, real life. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, absolutely. I mean, the travel that I did through Macaulay was amazing, life-changing. I spent summers 
uh, I think every summer I went to a different country. I did a, an internship in Sierra Leone oh. with a reproductive health organization. I volunteered at an IDP camp, an internally displaced persons like a refugee camp in Kenya. Um, uh, yeah, I mean, just incredible experiences. Um, and, and that both uh, sort of reinforced a love for, for travel or an interest in travel that I had before that, uh, but also taught me a lot about how to travel and how to, how to exist in a, a global world where these connections uh, mattered, right? I think prior, you know, I'm, I'm 34. Uh, when I was a kid, um, the, you couldn't really stay in touch with somebody you met while you traveled, right? Like you would, I don't know, you'd go for, a, there, there were no smartphones, there was no internet, there was, there was the access to other people that we have today didn't exist. So there was, so I started traveling at a time where the world started changing um, and it became possible to, to build long-term relationships, really close connections with people, regardless of geography. Um, and I learned to do that at Macaulay. And, um, and, and then also, I mean, just being able to uh, have access to all of CUNY's resources. I took classes at Hunter and City and Baruch and John Jay and um, I was just able to, to learn exactly the things that I wanted to learn, find the professors who were talking about things that I was interested in and really build an education for myself. Yeah. Um, wow. I'm very impressed with your travels. I need to take advantage of the, the Macaulay uh, travel offerings. Um, you know, I, I see some questions in the chat. Uh, people are very interested in your, in your spices. Uh, a question from Jean about are any of your spices obtained overseas? And she has a comment, Macedonia has some beautiful spices. Oh. Uh, all of our spices are obtained overseas. Uh, no, I wouldn't say all, there are some that are grown here, um, but uh, yeah, most of our, our partner farmers are outside of the US. We work with farms in 20 different countries. Um, we don't work with anybody in Macedonia at the moment. We do get quite a bit of really beautiful Mediterranean herbs from Turkey. Um, you know, sometimes it's just a question of uh, what, uh, I guess, let me step back for a second. Um, when we're deciding where to source from, uh, sometimes it's a conversation about which spice we want. Chef has been asking about something, we want to go find it, or I have an idea that it'll sell well. And so uh, we start with the spice that we want, and then I do a lot of research to figure out where that spice is grown really well. That's one approach. And then try to track down farmers who are growing it. Um, which means a lot of research on the internet, looking up articles, talking to NGOs that work with farmers in that country, a lot of time on social media. I mean, I, I didn't mention this earlier, but this has been a major advantage of social media for the business. We meet farmers on, on social media all the time. That's cool. um, uh, yeah, all the time. So, uh, so spending time on social media in groups of farmers in different places and, and try to put the pieces together that way. Yeah, it looks like Gina has a follow-up question. Uh, she's asking about seeds. Uh, and if you sell seeds that uh, she could start her own collection. In uh, there was a question earlier about uh, import regulations and uh, spices are easy to import unless you call them seeds. And if you call them seeds, then you're part of like a USDA or an agricultural process that's a huge pain. So um, most of our spices actually are not viable seeds. They go through a sterilization process one way or another, which means they probably won't grow. And that's both for, a food, for food safety, but also uh, for the U.S. government's regulations about importing spices versus seeds. Gotcha. Um, and then speaking of like the orders, Stephanie had a question about how do you handle the fulfillment of orders? Yeah, great question. Uh, for the first year, I did it all by myself. Um, I mean, maybe my like my brother or a friend would come over and help me pack orders during the holiday season, but we I did I ran it out of my apartment. Um, so that was really hard and really uh, challenging. Um, it just takes up a lot of time uh, and you don't have the expertise or the systems for it. But since I didn't have the money to hire somebody else to do it, that's what I had to do. And I would take a granny cart to the post office twice a week and I made friends with somebody at the post office. They would open the back door for me, let me hand them all the packages that I'd already pre-labeled. This was my life. Um, and then we slowly built up to be able to, to afford a fulfillment center, hire a fulfillment centers. Um, Sometimes it's also called a 3PL, uh, third party logistics company. Um, so we now work with two companies like that. Our inventory, our spice jars are stored at their warehouse and an order comes in and it syncs through to their, their operating system, their um, software. And somebody prints out a piece of paper and walks down an aisle, like it looks like kind of a Costco aisle or something like that. And they pull a bunch of things or Ikea, like those kinds of warehouses pull a couple of jars off the shelf, put them in a box and ship them out. Um, 
but as we've grown that, uh, that has been challenging because we have sort of outgrown the capacity of one of those fulfillment centers, or we realized that shipping to California from Pennsylvania, which is where the warehouse is located, is uh, inefficient and expensive. So we try to find someplace a little uh, further west. But um, when you get to this, you know, when you get to the point where you're asking those questions or having those problems, you're usually in a pretty good place. The business is going well. You know, you have a really steady supply of orders. Um, and and those those kinds of companies tend to have high minimums. Uh, they're they're expensive, so you know you have to be doing business of a decent size to be able to make it work. Yeah, Charmaine says that they are beautifully packaged, um, and she had a question about you know using recycled materials and if you do that and if sustainability is also you know plays a key factor in packaging. Yeah, the short answer is yes, of course. Uh, sustainability is a big part of any packaging decision. Our, our boxes are 100% recycled. Our glasses, are, our glass jars are 100% recyclable. Um, but what I've been pretty surprised to find, especially as we've gotten bigger and big enough to kind of uh, commission somebody to make packaging for us, is that sustainable materials are very hard to find. I mean, forget expensive. They are expensive, but they just truly don't exist in the volumes that even a, a small company like ours would need. Um, you know, we have, we have talked to, I don't know, a half dozen at least plastic manufacturers to try to convert our plastic containers. You can see them behind me. These are the restaurant, our restaurant packaging. Um, try to convert those to post-consumer plastic uh, or bioplastics, and it's almost impossible. Um, that, you know, they can do 20%, which at some point is just greenwashing. It's just to be able to say, yes, we use post-consumer recycled plastic. Uh, so it's, it's been really challenging and pretty frustrating to see how few options there are for a, a business of our size, at least that wants to be more, uh, sustainable in our packaging and just can't find the, the suppliers or the materials to do that. Wow. Yeah. Um, you know, that, that kind of leads to Jean's question about like, what makes you see red? You know, we've talked a lot about the challenges and acknowledging the real challenges of being an entrepreneur is really good because you can give some really great advice. So, you know, like what are, what are the things that you would like to accomplish or maybe, you know, you get stuck at the supply chain level or at the partner level? Yeah. Um, I mean, it's a cliche that entrepreneurship is a roller coaster. Some days you're on top of the world. Everything is amazing. This is the best decision I ever made. And some days uh, you feel like crap because nothing is going your way and people are telling you no and you've discovered some typo on your labels that <laughs> makes you crazy. Like all of those things happen. Um, I, uh, I, have, I have learned to slow down a little bit. Like when, I'm, when I feel myself getting like really worked up, take a step away from my computer take the dog for a walk, just like take a breath. Uh, but also as much as possible, and you know, sometimes easier said than done, but as much as possible to learn from those, um, those issues. So if something went wrong, what was the system behind it that didn't make it go right? Like where was the, what, what was missed and how was that missed? And what's the system that we could put into place uh, to make sure that it doesn't get missed again? We just, I, I mean, I mentioned that label typo issue. We just had that issue. Uh, we yesterday we found a, a pretty embarrassing type, not like a bad word, but just like a, an embarrassing typo on a label that we produced for a customer. Um, and so that turned into a whole conversation about where that typo could have been introduced and what we could have done to fix it and what we're going to do for all of our labels going forward. So one of one of them is one one thing I would say is just learning from those mistakes uh, and figuring out how not to make them again. Um, and the other thing is that when I have found personally a lot of value in disliking doing something. Like if I really don't like doing something, I, I need to, I can use that uh, as a motivation to stop doing that thing, to figure out a better way to do that or to, to find somebody else who will do it better for me. So, um, you know, there's, there's something about not liking aspects of your job so that you can push yourself to stop, to fire yourself from those things, to find other, other ways to get them done. Yeah. Um, you know, as we're closing in on 10, about 10 minutes left, just want to encourage anyone who uh, has questions to please drop them in the Q and a, um, you know, we'll continue to answer them live. Um, Ethan question about your partnership with women owned small businesses. We'd love to hear about that. Yeah. I mean, we, we are really like a, you know, a connector business in the sense that all of our partner farmers are small businesses themselves. And we are uh, working with lots of small businesses at this end. You know, we, we obviously supply a lot of home cooks, but uh, working with restaurants, working with manufacturers of all kinds of things, um, supplying other spice companies. We, we work with a lot of other small businesses just by the nature of our business. Um, and uh, 
we, for whatever reason, I wouldn't necessarily say it was intentional, but we have a lot of uh, women entrepreneur friends. And so we've done a lot of projects with them, especially on our, on our, um, on our website and on our domestic side. So we, we do work with some women farmers. Our star anise are, is uh, actually wild harvested by two women, two cousins. Um, saffron that we get from Afghanistan is largely harvested by women. That's much more complicated. They don't actually own the farms. They work on the farms. It's a different conversation. But, um, uh, but we also work with a lot of women-owned businesses here um, and find ways to partner with them either uh, by providing them with some of the ingredients that they use and then buying those products that they're making back to sell on our site. We've done quite a bit of that uh, between chocolate and pickles and soap and other you know, tea blends and things like that. Um, so I would say uh, working with entrepreneurs of all backgrounds and orientations across the board has been really interesting. It's been a big part of my personal journey as an entrepreneur and, and it's just a, a big part of what we do on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, um, you know, I, was, I have a few questions that I want to close out on. This one's a really fun one from Jean. Have you ever been on Shark Tank or thought about oh. it? <laughs> no, my co-founder, my co-founder really wants to go on Shark, Shark Tank. I don't, I don't necessarily personally love being on camera like that, but um, he really wants to go on Shark Tank. So uh, we're, we, we have some, we found some contacts there. I'm going to see if we can maybe make it happen this I don't know, season that starts. I have no idea. I have no idea. It seems like a ridiculous, such a ridiculous experience, but maybe we'll be able to pull it off. <laughs> Jean says she'll pitch for you. And, uh, you know, if I see you on my TV, I'll, I'll know your co-founder want out that argument. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> um, and then Stephanie, has got a great question. You know, if you weren't in the spice business, is there anything else you'd be interested in pursuing or maybe like a, a market that you see is really viable right now? It's a, that's a good question. I mean, in food, uh, I have lots of ideas. If you're not in food, uh, I probably don't know your industry well enough to be able to, to make any uh, specific recommendations. Um, but I think there was a, a comment earlier about sustainable packaging. Uh, Jeffrey said something about sustainable packaging in the chat. I think that's there's a huge market there, um, sustainable packaging options. Um, I think there's a huge uh, market around upcycling food products, food waste. I mean, think about the amount of coffee that we throw away, right? Like you buy these buy this these coffee grounds that have been grown by a farmer fermented dried processed shipped roasted ground you pour water through them for 90 seconds and then you throw all of it away uh i think there's i think there's a lot of room in food waste um and i think there's a lot of room in education around around food around cuisines and cultures and the relationships between um what we eat and the cultures behind them uh, people love to learn about what other people like to eat and love to learn uh, some of those recipes, get to taste some of that food. Um, and we've seen this in, in media, we've seen this in cookbooks, we've seen this in companies like mine, but many others also that are sort of introducing people to ingredients they've never tasted before. Um, so I think there's I think there's a lot of room there in that education component, teach people to cook. Yeah, well, you've got some great ideas here. Uh, if anyone wants to jump on those ideas, um, but for you, Ethan, what is kind of like your North Star vision? You know, we've talked about the next few years for Burlap and, and Barrel and kind of the immediate need, but where do you hope to see the company go? And you know, maybe think ten years long, long term future. Yeah, I really have no idea. Uh, I'm not a, <laughs> I'm not a long term thinker. I like to focus on the thing I have to do tomorrow. No, I mean, I the vision has always been. Um, around social impact. And so wanting to grow the business partially so that we can expand our impact, <clears throat> excuse me, at origin, buy more from our partner farmers, buy more from more farmers, um, as well as here. And, and that, you know, that education piece that I just mentioned is a big part of our, uh, a big part of our social impact mission is teaching people about cuisine and culture and, and ingredients in those, uh, in, in other people's food. Um, so I want to do more of that. Uh, and in the meantime, a lot of what we have to do for the business is, is just tactical stuff, is boring tactical stuff. Does the website work better if we put the prices in red or in blue? Uh, do, do people respond better to new products or old products? There's a lot of those kinds of conversations that, that we're going to be having over the next six months or something to figure out um, how to fine tune the, the business that we've already built. You know, there's a, there's a startup phase, there's a growth phase, and then there's a stabilization phase. And we're kind of on the cusp of that stabilization phase where we built this kind of crazy thing that you don't think would really work. So how do we, how do we lock it in? How do we make sure that it, it continues to work? 
And that's the, that's the next stage. Thanks. Um, yeah, I have one more question for you because I want to give you time at the end just to chat about like some of the hiring opportunities that you've got coming up. Um, but we've talked a lot about, about the challenges, the pain points, the obstacles, and I kind of want to land on, you know, talking about the joys of being an entrepreneur and what some of your favorite moments or memories or milestones in your, in your journey as an entrepreneur have been. Yeah. Thank you for asking that question. That's an amazing <laughs> point and I appreciate you bringing it up. Uh, it's so much fun. It's the most fun job I've ever had. I mean, I work 14 plus hours a day because I, you know, maybe I don't love every single moment of it, but I think what I get to do is really interesting. The problems that I get to solve are really complicated and, and appealing. They're problems that I care about. Um, I get to work with people that I like and I get to set my own schedule, which often means working more than less, but at least I get to make that decision. Um, you know, we, we started the business partially because we like to travel. And so travel has been a big part of the business from the beginning, building a remote team, working from home, all of these systems that, that will work remotely from anywhere um, means that I not only can travel, but kind of have to travel for work. And that's amazing. That was what one of the things that, that I really wanted when I sat down to think about what my life would be like as, as a founder of this company. Um, uh, and, and then, um, I mean, this, this is also kind of a cliche, but the people you meet and the other entrepreneurs, the other business owners, the, the, the people who create things and invent things. And, and as a founder, you, you become a part of a world of people who take initiative, who, who see opportunity, who pursue their ideas, who, who are not just kind of sitting at home, punching a clock, doing their thing. And, you know, for, for a lot of people, that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, I don't believe that self-worth is tied into how you spend your time during the day. Uh, but, um, but it has been amazing to meet such interesting people working on interesting problems and get to, you know, kind of talk to them as, as peers to, to be a part of that broader conversation. Yeah. And I guess this is a cliche question, but last question, I promise. Um, and I'll give you some time to chat about hiring. Um, you know, if you can give one piece of takeaway advice, this golden nugget of advice to, you know, young entrepreneurs, everyone in the audience today, what would that be? I had, uh, so one piece of advice that a friend of mine who owns a restaurant had, he had started the restaurant quite several years before I started this. But when I first started Burlap and Barrel, I, I went and uh, sat down with him at the bar of his restaurant. And he said, Ethan, if you can think of anything else to do with your life, do that other thing. If, if, if you can come up with any other way that you'll be happy, be happy in that other way. Um, and if you have to do this, do this. Uh, so, I mean, I say that with a grain of salt, uh, no pun intended, I have a spice company, but um, <laughs> you know, to, to say like, there, there is at some point a certain compulsion that makes you that just you feel like you have to do it I, I don't understand why I have to live my life this life this way but I have to um, and um, I would say hold out for for that feeling uh, if you have an idea like kind of test it out ask yourself does that idea make you feel that way you have to pursue this idea you find it so interesting so appealing so compelling that you have to pursue it and that's uh, that's what I would that's what I would look for is that idea Wow, great, powerful words to land on, Ethan. Uh, this makes me want to think of the next big idea tomorrow. Um, but I just want to say thank you so much again, Ethan. It was just so great to hear your experiences and learn, learn a little bit more from you. Um, and thank you to everyone in the audience today who joined us and asked these really great questions. Um, before we you know, officially end and close out, uh, I think Charmaine put the link in the chat, but to learn more about Ethan and Burlap and Barrel, you can visit the website there. Um, and Ethan just shared his contact information. Ethan, you want to talk just a little bit about hiring? Yeah, yeah um, we are hopefully going to be hiring next year uh, for a couple of positions, might be part-time, might be full-time, I don't really know, but related to supply chain, related to marketing. Um, so if you're interested in what we're doing, uh, if you are going to be graduating next June or have graduated recently and are, are interested in talking about what a job might look like, please reach out. Um, or you just want advice or you want to talk through an idea or whatever I'm around, I'm happy to talk. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, uh, that's what's happening. Yeah. I love the Macaulay community for that. Um, and also thank you to the awesome folks at Macaulay. Uh, for putting together this event. Thank you to everyone. It is seven o'clock. So I want to let everyone go and enjoy the rest of your evening. And I'll turn it right back to Charmaine too. Oh, thank you. This was so enlightening. I enjoyed learning about your journey, um, Ethan. And I know 
Um, I've ordered from Girl Up and Barrel and I love the quality of the spices and just the packaging, the care, you can see the care that goes into just the packaging as well. So definitely um, anyone on here, you know, the holidays are coming around and definitely they do make a great, you know, stocking stuffer, I guess, <laughs> um, but great quality. And thank you so much for letting us know about job opportunities. We have a great career, um, career development office here at Macaulay. So we'll let them know um, to look, look out for that. And so we can share it with our community. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you, Jane. Thank you, Ethan, so much for giving your time with us tonight. Enjoy. Thank you for having me. Yeah, thanks. Have a good Take night, everyone. everyone. Be well. Bye.